Okay. So today, for this week, I have prepared, um, uh, you know, the, the section of this week. Uh, I have prepared a chapter dedicated to, uh, which is week four, to Bhakti Yoga, to what could be, what is the practice of um, love and devotion, and which is um, probably uh, one of the least understood uh, practices, although at the same time, one of the most widely used throughout cultures and throughout regions practice. So I'm going to try to speak about the, what Bhakti Yoga is all about. To do that, I have prepared four lessons. Uh, one is Bhakti Yoga that you will read. This is, uh, this is in fact a lesson from Fernando Picasso which is a good introduction and it links it to the Bhagavad Gita very nicely. Uh, the other lesson I have prepared has basically two satsangs uh, of Guru Raj uh, speaking about grace and Guru Shakti because Guru Shakti is one of our main practices and it is a practice that some people have difficulties with due to probably prejudices of different kinds or a misunderstanding of, of, what, it, of what it is all about. Now, the next lesson that has also two satsangs of Guru Raj is also a lesson prepared by Fernando uh, based mainly on a beautiful satsang of Guru Raj called How to Open Your Hearts, which is um, the main mission of uh, us as an organization and as teachers to help people open their hearts, and which is what is most required in the world that we are living. And finally, I have another lesson about affirmation. So you have enough material to spend all week because um, these are very deep uh, teachings. So, you know, maybe you can do it in one week or you need more weeks, but it is material that is good to go through and in today's uh, satsang, what I'm going to do is go through these two satsangs uh, like I did the other day in a uh, commented, you know, fashion. Uh, so that, let me put this here. So we have Grace and Guru Shakti and Guru Raj speaking about Guru Shakti. So. Let me start with um, let me start with giving a a first explanation of what is grace of or what is it that we call shakti or grace or the Holy Spirit. It is something that the different spiritual traditions in different ways use to, 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 to speak about something which is really undefinable. But it, it is the, a very subtle energy um, that holds everything together and that is the we could say the eternal expression of that divine energy is like the, I don't know, it's like if, if I had to put that an example in physics, 
you know, it would be that equation that everything, uh, so for example, when the physics, uh, when physicians, not doctors, but people that study physics, uh, when, when physics try to discover the equation for the unified field, i.e. something that can define the movement of anything, being it big or little, they are trying to find that, that relationship between things that is always there in whatever situation, it's always there and because it is there and has that exact balance, you know, like the one that an equation provides, uh, like E equals MC squared, because it has that exact balance, it keeps everything as is, you know, it keeps this wonder which is manifestation. So imagine grace as, as that subtle energy, as a concept, but as an experience, grace is that energy that you feel when, and that's the only way I have to express it, when you feel close to God, when you feel in union, when you don't feel separated when you feel in union or close to God, uh, even if not in complete union, um, you have an experience of this certain, subtle energy that puts everything together in the right place all the time. And it's like the Holy Spirit, you know, it's like, it's like a living thing. Although, as Guruji taught, the God that we speak about is a neutral energy. So it is not a person. It is not um, a will. A person that has a will and that um, can be angry with you or can condemn you or things like that. But a God which is completely impersonal, like an equation, like an equation of signs, you know, it's something that uh, everything, everything follows and there is no distinction. I many times jokingly explain this saying, um, um, a murderer, you know, a child rapist and a saint that fall from a fifth story building arrive to the floor at the same speed. And there is nothing in this universe that will make the saint go more slowly. But grace, maybe grace is that, that uh, how do you call these things that you put in a window to take the shadow away, to take the sun away, like this, well, Imagine, no, the typical thing that you put in a window to take the sun away and goes out of the, you know, and then the same maybe through grace falls before hits hitting the floor, falls to this, uh, this other place, and then everything is amortiguated. But basically, what I'm saying that this energy, this grace, is the this Shakti is the most subtle manifestation of that divine force that is impersonal. It is associated with the feminine because it, ha it is a caring energy. It is an energy that keeps everything together. It is an energy that keeps everything under balance. It is an energy that keeps everything into motion also in in a uh, in 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 they they call it lila's play you no know? in in the play of lila in the play of the divine feminine you no know? um, so that is grace as an energy but what is guru shakti with respect to grace well guru shakti with respect to grace is something that is embedded in us as human beings that we are. For example, a little child, uh, if he feels 
if, if he's afraid, for example, imagine a five-year-old boy, if he's afraid, in his mind, naturally, he will call his father or mother, normally at five years old, probably his mother or her mother, uh, because, you know, that is, he will relate with that energy that takes care of everything through the concrete object of his mother. He would not be able to understand that uh, there is a universal mother taking care of everything. He needs a concrete mother to, to connect with that energy. And as soon as he connects with that energy and maybe listens, his mother say, okay, I'm going, don't worry, or something like that, uh, he will feel uh, comfort, comforted. So, um, it is embedded in human beings that to connect with this energy, with this subtle energy, you need an object to, to put your attention on, on that object as a, say, a channel to perceive that energy. And this the humanity has been doing throughout the ages, you know, the Christians do it with Christ, the Hindus with all kinds of gods, uh, people that, uh, religions that don't, uh, that they have some kind of um, thing against the impersonal God, in, in the personal God, like the, the Jewish tradition or the Muslim tradition, they have their songs and they, the, their ways to praise the Lord, which is a way of personifying him. So at the end of the day, we end up personifying him. We might personify him as someone with a big beard, 1,200 kilometers over our heads, or we might personify him in any other way. But we need to personify him in an odd object. We need an object because that is our nature and normally it will be a human object, you know, if we were cows, our gods would be cows. But because we are human, our gods are human. So the normal thing is that it would be a human. But, but it could also be a rock. Ramana Maharshi, a famous saint of uh, last century that many of you, you may know. Uh, you know, his object of devotion was a mountain. Aruna Chala, you know, a mountain, a rock. So it could be anything because a mountain is alive, of course. And, you know, if, 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 in your constitution, you can relate through this mountain with this energy that takes care of everything, then that is your Guru Shakti object of devotion. Uh, it's rare uh, that someone has a devotion for a mountain, but even a mountain, you can have devotion for a mountain. Ramana Maharshi, could see in that mountain, the mountain through which this energy of Shiva, or because it was his education and, you know, his, his things, he perceived that energy through that mountain because he believed in that mountain to, to be, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of the, the, where Shiva lived or something like that, you know? So through that mountain, he, he could draw from that subtle energy that we call Shakti. So, after doing this introduction, which is, and you know, everybody does Guru Shakti. Even atheists do Guru Shakti. Because everybody prays. Even atheists pray. Because you know, you might pray because you buy a lottery ticket and you say, I, I want to win, I want to win. Well, that, that prayer, for you to win or have a contract signed, that's a prayer. 
and you are directing that prayer somewhere. That depends on your imagination, your cultural background, your belief systems, your patternings of the mind. But the act, the act is the same act. It's trying to connect with that energy that will make you win the lottery or will make you have the contract signed or will make your beloved love you or you name it, whatever you are asking. So after this small introduction, I'm going to start uh, sharing the screen and with the satsang, uh, the first of, of both satsangs, which is uh, from Canada. It's a four minute uh, short satsang. Okay, we will put it like this. I understand that Tamari, pure Shakti, can be talked about, but never fully explained. But I would like to hear you again. Mm -hmm. Guru Shakti could also be called a grace. And if there's a clear channel, that grace can flow through the channel. Mm -hmm. Like our Karuna, she's a flautist. The flute, she plays the flute. Fine. Now, the flute does not create music, huh? but Karuna is blowing through it, and the music comes out for the world to enjoy. Likewise, the divinity flows through a clear channel to others. Now, why is this not a direct process? Why can't that grace flow to you directly instead of through some other object? The reason is this, being human, you need the touch of a human. So this is basically where I started that is this energy is the air flowing and the clear channel is the flute in the analogy that Guru Raj puts here. Uh, the energy is there and it's everywhere but we being humans we need to relate it through to relate with that energy through another human through a clear flute, not a flute that is dirty and doesn't make good music, but through a clear flute that can, being blown, that energy provide good music because the, the flute is clear. So basically, that is why we do Guru Shakti with Jesus or with Buddha or with Krishna or with Guru Raj because, because we are human we need to relate with a human mind that can evoke in us that, that connection that in reality we have, but that at the, at the beginning and being human throughout the path, um, you have to you have to surrender yourself, but to surrender yourself, you need, you need someone to surrender. The human mind works like that. It's made like that. And that is the dress that we are wearing, the dress of a human mind. So we need to do things that are good for a human mind. And connecting with that energy through Guru Raj, why is it easy? because you have his satsangs, you have access to that flute, which is his mind, his, which is his teachings. So which is, and try to find a better flute. Try to find a better, better teachings. You know, I, many times I, I tell it to people, you know, go and look around, look around. I mean, go to the Rupert Spiras, to the, you name them, the Muji, the Devaji, the Ramana Maharshi, the 
And I'm a Christian, a Christian. Look at everything out there and try to find something as consistent and as complete and as understandable as the music that comes from that flute, which is Guru Raj. And that is a gift that we have and that I am sure that humanity will discover in due time because these teachings provide with a connection with that mind and thus with a connection with grace. And grace, when grace acts, grace opens your heart. It is not you that you open your heart. It is grace, like the sun that opens the rose. It is not the rose that opens itself. It is the heat of the sun that opens the rose. So we continue now with the with this with this satsang. Sorry, sorry, I did something wrong. Yeah, no, okay. And that is how Guru Shakti flows. Uh, that grace can never be explained verbally, but it can be explained because grace is God really flowing to you hmm? and therefore Jesus said uh, that no one goes to the Father but through me hmm? so you have a focal point and when your problems are thrown off to the focal point you automatically draw through that channel that divine energy. So that is Guru Shakti. It's beautiful. Mm? It is beautiful. If one just develops greater receptivity towards it, you will find it flowing. If you want fresh air, you won't get it if all your windows are closed. Mm? You've got to open the window for the fresh air to come in. So that means to be receptive or of an open mind. Hmm? And that is part of Guru Shakti. Hmm? How it works is no one can understand. There are many things we see all around us that we can't even understand and we are busy with it every day. Electricity, they can't explain electricity. Hmm? Or magnetism, they, they can't explain it. And so many other things that cannot just be explained. But here, to use another analogy, there is a lot of electricity in the waterfall or in water, but that from the water, it can't come directly to your light. It requires a generator to capture the electricity in there and generate it to the whole city and the whole town and every room in your house. So, the Guru, can we call a generator? Hmm? That's all. And even if your bulb is broken hmm, or has fused, the generator is still working. Hmm? The energy is still there. So, if the one bulb is fused, we put another bulb in. Light is there. Okay, so I'm going to now start with the second video. Which is not this one. So just a moment.
Could you give us some new suggestions on how we can increase the intensity of our guru shakti practices? Mm. That's very easy. Don't do Guru Shakti. Well, I'm joking, you know that. Guru Shakti is something indefinable. It is the power of grace that you're drawing unto yourself by the practice. Now, Grace is so abstract, so you need a symbol hmm, to make it concrete. <coughs> and pouring yourself to that symbol, hmm, you're clearing your mind and drawing the grace to you. Did you have your, your bloody fools? Did you have your bloody Marys? Several, thank you. Well, awesome. good. <laughs> you see, so, 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 so that is, that is a method how to intensify, hmm? and become receptive to that Guru Shakti that pours into you. I don't know if I told you this before, perhaps somewhere in the world. Uh, hmm? Just take a picture of me, for example. Right. Sit down at it. And just pour your... Is that me? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hmm? <laughs> and just pour out all your problems and say, Guruji, you're a bloomin' bastard. <laughs> These are my problems and I'm pouring it out to you. Take them. And believe you me, your burden would be so much lessened. It works, you know. It works. Okay. So, basically, in this sentence, why do we use Guru Shakti mainly? Well, for the same reason that we pray to God mainly, because of our problems. We feel fear, we feel our life has no meaning, we might feel, you name, you know, all these things that make you feel inadequate or insecure or make you feel like that five-year-old child that looks for his mother or, his, or her father um, uh, to find this, this, this connection, this feeling himself safe. Now, by just doing this, by just pouring your problems, by just surrendering your problems to that object, by just saying, okay, these are my problems, I give them to you. Somehow you are also, and this is a psychological position if you want, I always explain that in the same way that in Hatha Yoga we do physical positions, in Raj Yoga or in the Royal Path 
or in the royal yoga, we do mental positions, mental asanas. So you put yourself in the position of surrendering your problem, which is giving your problem and accepting the solution that is provided to you, which is, which is somehow immediately activates acceptance of the situation. You accept the situation, you surrender the problem. And once you surrender the problem, really, uh, that is the same thing as to say you surrender you surrender the mental concept that described the situation as a problem. What happens is that solution, instead of living in the problem, you live in the challenge, you live in the solution, uh, because you can, you know, in life, you can look at the solution or you can look at the problem. Many people, you know, when they describe a situation, they describe the problem. And there are other kinds of people that when they describe the same situation, they are describing the solution. It's a matter of attitude. The situation is the same situation, but one mind is focused in the problem and another mind is focused in the solution. When you surrender the problem, immediately the mind focuses on the solution in a natural way. So it has a psychological effect by its own, but it also has a spiritual effect because it is not the same. There makes a difference to what, it makes a difference what flute the flautist is playing. You know, it could be a very well-made flute a very well-made instrument or a less well-made instrument. The musician, the one that blows the flute, God is the same God, but the instrument, you know, might be of different quality. We have an advantage with Guru Raj, which is a a high, high quality instrument. And that's why Guru Shakti is such an important practice. And in fact, and I tell you this by my own experience, is the practice that if you keep on it, leads you all the way. You really is the most powerful one. Is Guruji used to say, it is 70% of everything that I give you, 70% is Guru Shakti. The rest is the teachings and the techniques and you name it. Guru Shakti, which is actual, which is experienceable day to day, is 70%. So, to finish, let us finish this video. I mean, many of you I've been doing it and all that. Huh? Yes, why not? What the devil is a guru there for, that devil? So you just pour out, sit down, you can laugh or cry or whatever and say, yeah, this is my problem, Guruji, uh, you take it. And I'm strong enough to take any problem of anyone. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands around the world that do that on a regular basis. And just as any psychologist will tell you, just by pouring out, pouring out, you lessen your burden. Because it's not only a matter of simple psychology. What do these psychologists know about these things? They bullshit is. They'll sit and listen to you and listen to you and listen to you and 
uh, you think you feel better, you don't. But that spiritual force is not there. Ah, ah. that spiritual force is important. Whereby you sitting down doing your Guru Shakti hmm? for a few moments and you'll find uh, you're just pouring it away out of your system. Your mind becomes more calm. And for Guru Shakti you do not even need to sit down. But just to have that remembrance. Hmm? And by having that remembrance, it doesn't pile up into a lot. She's dissipating it all the time. Slow process, but it works. Hmm? But when you feel really troubled within yourself, really troubled, then you sit down for five or ten minutes and just talk to that blooming bastard there. Just talk to him and tell him. Because he is saluting the divinity that is within you. It symbolizes that, look, You are divine, and I share that divinity within you. So let us get rid of the idiocy of your mind. So simple. I think we should have a program on the screen course, who I could demonstrate to you the power of Guru Shakti. Make a note of that. We'll fit that in. Hmm? <coughs> Mind you, I like that bastard. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to activate you all. <clears throat> and probably just to just to finish a little bit my comments on these two satsang, uh, in this last bit that uh, we saw, this is a technique that I have been practicing for many, many years. Uh, until it has become natural in me and it's very very practical so that things don't pile up in your mind you know that the, you know instead of having things piling up in your mind that you know whenever you have an unhappy thought or something like that just do guru shakti with that and just give it away to to guru raj and you just don't allow anything to pile up in your mind the, the end result is that you, you somehow become uh, completely fearless in the sense that, that, you, that you are in, in touch with that energy that is taking care of everything. And instead of thinking that there is nothing okay, you, you, you leave things as with the perception that everything is okay, including when you know when the adventure is in its peak and and uh, you uh, you might you know be dealing with what normally people would call a problem like i don't know an illness or you name it um, you don't leave it as a problem you leave it you know as part of this perfection um, and just, but one of the secrets is don't allow things piling up in your mind, which is, you know, these repetitive things that, you know, you, your wife told
told you a bad word that morning and then instead of giving that away you start piling up on that it comes back to you and you you know put more energy on it and fucking wife she's a bitch and and then it comes back to your mind and you put more energy on it and you pile it up pile it up pile it up and then it becomes a problem but if you you know you do this practice that anytime it comes something of that nature you just give it away through guru shakti works very well you end up piling up nothing and you end up being non affected and at the same time completely integrated with everything it doesn't mean that you become senseless all the contrary you become very very sensitive uh, uh, but also very sensible no so anyhow questions uh, gloria um, can you hear me so, yes perfectly oh okay what happens in an extreme situation like living during the Holocaust and being in a concentration camp where from second to second, your life is threatened? How can you apply this principle to a situation? And it's such an extraordinary situation. Well, uh, obviously there are extraordinary situations. Mm. For this, I will put you, I will use a little story about Milarepa. Uh, Milarepa had, I don't know if you know the story of Milarepa, who was a guru from the Tibet. He had, uh, uh, he was first, he was a very bad guy, he was robbing, then he became like an ascetic and lived all kinds of ascetism, and he ended his life being a very well-respected spiritual guru. Uh, and you know his elder son or something like that I don't remember I'm paraphrasing the story but one of his sons uh, or his preferred son died and then he was crying he was crying because his son died and one of the chelas came to him and told him but uh, uh, my guru haven't you taught us that everything is illusion that everything is perfect that everything uh, how is it that you are crying? And the Milarepa said, yes, everything is illusion, but this is a super illusion. <laughs> so what, the, what I'm trying to say here is that you may be faced with extreme situations. And in an extreme situation, this principle may be a big challenge to apply. But if you look at the people that survived in the Holocaust, those were the ones that could see the, the goodness among all that darkness. They could find goodness here or goodness there. They became, you know, they could find the miracle. They could find the, 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 the light amongst that darkness. Those were the ones that, you know, that by that Shakti, that by that grace, you know, overcame uh, that situation, which is obviously an extreme situation. So sometimes we might be facing extreme situations. And in an extreme situation that normally we are not faced, that's why they, call, they are called extreme situations, because it's not the normal, it's, it's the the abnormal, but even in an extreme situation, you can apply this principle. You can, you know, accept it and say, okay, this is experience at the end of the day. And it came to me, there must be something for me to learn here. So I give it to you and you tell me the way. And if you do that sincerely and honestly, he tells you the way, even in extreme situations. Thank you. I would, well, I would just suggest a book yeah, right. by Viktor Frankl. Man's Search for Meaning. Right. Yeah. I have to read that again. It's very good. Yeah. It's exactly about that. It's amazing how some people can manage something like that. Yeah. Thank you. 
more questions or sharing if you want to share something doesn't need to be a question marjorie that you never speak Ted, that you always share something i have a question okay victor hey everybody and i just wanted to say i'm uh I wanted to thank every, thank you for have, letting me attend. Uh, humbly, I, I do learn from this. Um, I was drawn to look up Guru Shakti on Monday, and I did a lot of research on it. And I think this helps me complete my understanding of it. But I still have some questions. Um, I think that the words I'm going to say maybe won't resonate exactly with what I'm thinking, but I'm going to use words because. As uh, Guru Raj says, you can't really describe it a lot. But within that, uh, as a guru would bestow shakti upon someone else, I wanted to ask about the difficulties of guru shakti, as I understand it. When is it a good time for someone to take in guru shakti? Is it always a good time? Is it something that you can deepen your guru shakti over time or if you're at one level are you always at that level that's and then you have to wait for another lifetime to, no. to deepen the level that's my question about it you have to wait for no other lifetime you can do it in one lifetime you can do it in six months and i would tell you um, keep doing guru shakti non-stop for six months in a row in a way that you act you think you clean your teeth you cook and you sleep in the presence of guru raj or your object of devotion if you had another one but guru raj you know is quite appropriate for the times because his mind is fresh recent and the language is appropriate and understandable and you will get self-realized so every every moment is is a good moment and as i tell you if you train your mind to be in that presence all the time that's the secret that's the main secret it's difficult there eh? because you know we we tend to want to be our little eye, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't want to know about, what, what about of my share in the, in, the, in the cake? But there's no cake in reality, there's no share for anybody because there's no cake for anybody. You come naked and you go away naked. And between these two nakedness, uh, there is only experience or between these two silences you come from silence you return to silence and between all these two silences there is all this music there is all this experience so it's only experience okay <laughs> thank you more questions or sharing or whatever Yes, Maria. Maria, I cannot listen to you. Unmute. Okay. Okay. I have had moments. I've had a hard time in my first few years of meditating, understanding Guru Shakti and sort of coming to terms with it. I've mentioned before as a Catholic, with always looking at, you know, pictures of saints and stuff. And it's like, well, GR is not my saint. I got over that. And in time, through understanding and hearing his teachings and getting it, I've had moments of that grace. And it surprised me. And when I'm in it, I want more. And it's easier to get sort of when you're feeling in it. And it's a feeling of complete support. I don't know how to explain it. It's like whatever you're going through emotionally or even through the day physically in your time and space, there's a feeling of 
support, like you're being nurtured through this, you're being guided, it's okay, it's like someone's watching over you and it's, it's very interesting and it's very subtle and it's very wonderful and it's very fleeting. So the thought of being able to develop that, to have more of that is now very exciting to me because I had such a hard time getting it, understanding it, or just feeling it. So, yeah, I just had to share that. Good. So, Ram Raman, it's Galina. Yeah, Galina. So, yeah. yeah. So, I, I always had the problem with the, the Kura Shakti. Now I understand I probably don't do it like a... Um, I, I don't do on a regular basis. And um, I think it a little opened my, my, my eyes today um, about w what is it. Because always when I look to Kura Shakti, to me, it's just like his picture. I didn't see no, this. No, it's not a... his picture. You are connecting with that mind. You are connecting with the... with Through that object, with that grace. But that is the personal God. It's, that is the manifested God. So you are connecting with that energy. It's like when you pray to Jesus or when probably here everybody has prayed to someone because we have all been raised in a religion. Unless you were born in the communist China. Well, you, Galina, were born in the communist Russia, right? Yes. So, but you is, prayed, probably. Is. You prayed in, uh, you know... <laughs> No, because but in my is, mind, we still, uh, in our mind, we still pray to, to God. Yeah, because you know that is transmitted from families, you know, from parents to children. So normally that is very common in every culture, in every country. Uh, people have been trained to somehow to connect with that energy through, uh, they've called it many things, but we call it Guru Shakti you know, through an object of devotion that represents that energy incarnated somehow, you know. But you are connecting with a mind, you are connecting with a universal mind. In fact, what happens is that you are connecting with your own superconscious mind. But it is being reflected like the external. So is this, this energy is both within yourself and all around yourself. And you connect first within yourself through meditation, but then you realize it all around yourself. And Guru Shakti is, you know, when, because if you don't do Guru Shakti, you will be uh, taken over by your little eye so easily. The only way is that you can surrender that little eye to another eye, because if not, your little eye will be there and it will be looking for its own benefit, always. Think about it. The little eye is always looking to survive and to perpetuate itself. And so he will, and, and he is very, very, He's a cunning animal, Guruji used to say. So he's very, 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 very dangerous, in fact. That's why also having this object of devotion is good, because you surrender your little eye to that object of devotion. And then your little eye, it's, because if not, what do you do with your little eye? To whom you surrender it? You need to make this act like, like the surrender that a toddler does to his mother, you know, and which is in total trust, you know, and they surrender totally, they trust totally, they don't even think about it. Okay. Melissa. Yeah, I'm trying something? to get I'm trying to get all the other pictures on the screen, but I've lost you. <laughs> ah, okay, well, we, we will be in one window. <laughs> Go ahead, say something. Hello. This yeah, is hello, John. I was, I was just wanting to share that, um, you know, when I 
when I began learning these techniques, and I, there was this little picture of the guru sitting on the table behind the teeth. And, you know, I was there for stress reduction, and I was really not up for any kind of cult weird stuff with some guru, right? I was Mr. John Wayne, and my mind was not open to what was being offered, but it also was not being shoved down my throat. So I said, well, what the heck, you know, I would like some stress reduction. So I'm just going to do the part that makes sense to me in my mind, because that's what I got to work with. And that's really all we have to work with when we come to this, you know, it's like you look at this picture. And if you were like me, you would be thinking like, what kind of a stupid idiot am I? In fact, I'm not even going to do this because this is stupid. Okay. So some of us are harder headed than others you know we come into it with different things and students come to us with different levels of not being open to that um, but i really think that um, little by slow it, it wormed its way into my heart and it's it's very very powerful and for me um, it's way more than just looking at the picture it's almost like looking through the picture Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about experiences and, oh, the face moved, or sometimes I have, uh, I've had very, almost like hallucinations looking at the picture. You know, I'm not taking drugs or doing anything like that, but the picture's moving and my mind is contributing to what I'm seeing and all that. That was in the earlier days more so than now. But that was what John's little mind needed to start believing that there really was something going on there, you know? And that's just me. Okay? I don't know what other people, what their experiences are. But I can tell you that the more I did it, the more I was affected, and I didn't always know that I was affected. And there's that saying about, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven within, and all else shall be added unto you. Well, that's really what we're doing when we do this. And I think of Guru Shakti sometimes in the abstract is that sum total of knowledge that Guru Rai says you'll, you'll know everything without knowing anything because you will just be in the peace of stillness. And if you can carry that with you from a formal practice that you start begrudgingly, but you just kind of force yourself to do it, just a little bit each day. And you listen to the teachings which begin to add on to your conceiving while you're doing Guru Shakti. What ended up happening years later for me was I walked through my day and I can always go back to that. And it's exactly for me like what I heard Ramon say, which is that in the middle of a volcanic storm, I can stay calm. And I cannot worry, even though it's really horrible, you know. And I mean, we all have different examples of that in our lives. And most of them aren't as extreme as the Holocaust. But we all live in that every day. All of the things that happen. It could be as simple as somebody cutting you off and trap. Or it could be someone getting sick. It could be you getting sick. In my case, it could be stepping on a valve in a boiler room and the Water's pouring out, and I'm like, ah, where do I shut it off, you know? It really doesn't matter, but I can't even think of the solution when, when the squirrel cage is active. I have to be able to get centered and calm, and I have to practice that, because if I practice it, it comes quickly. And I can do it under almost any condition. Now, that doesn't happen right away, but it happened little by slow. And uh, you know, I'm surprised it happened at all because if I look back at the way that I started, I mean, really, I was a hopeless case. So rather than being just about this sort of thing and recognizing that my mind is my biggest enemy, you know, because my so-called logical mind is very cunning, it's going to talk me out of doing what I actually need to do. And that's, that's the, for me, is, is a, it's a huge key. That's, that's why I think GR said that, 70%. You know, it's walking through your day 
it's not just the 20 minutes of meditation or, you know, the, the pranayama. It's all of that stuff put together. But that 70% Guru Shakti, that's where the rubber meets the road. So anyway, I'll shut up. But thanks for listening to me. And I just wanted to share that because that's what I heard. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Yeah, very, very nice description and very, very good. Uh, and in fact, it's true that, uh, you know, um, many people uh, um, uh, for different reasons uh, say, what a stupid practice, but humanity has been doing it for ages. In many cases, the most, you know, even, even uh, you know, you could have a picture of your wife in your desk at the office, and you know, and when you are feeling troubled, you look a little bit to the picture of your wife, and just by looking at the picture of your wife, you recover that love that you have for your wife, and you relax a little bit. So it's a practice commonly and widely practiced by all the population, they don't call it Guru Shakti, but it's that practice. So probably one of the things that as teachers we have to do is to explain that practice well. Uh, because as John said, it is not just looking at the picture. It is creating that connection with, with, with that personification of the divine which is creating a connection with the divine, which is a neutral energy. But because our minds are human minds and it is patterned, our mind is patterned to have that connection in, to begin with, we had it with our mother. All of, all of human beings have had a mother. So all of human beings have that impression with their mother that human figure that protects them, it's part of how the mechanism is built and thus it is necessary. It is, it's a necessary tool. And not only necessary, but the most important of all tools that we have been given. Yes, Ted. Um. I want to say first that all these comments from everyone have been really valuable for me. I really appreciate that a lot. And I really can relate to a lot of what John just said also. Um, my question is, in the video at the end, um, Guru Raj speaks, he, he says, make a note. Um, sometime I will demonstrate the power of Guru, uh, Guru Shakti. Did he ever do that? Do we have a video? Is, is there a <laughs> Well, you know, I will tell you one of the ones that I have experienced. I have experienced many. Uh, and uh, some of them are those that you could call uh, absolutely miraculous. But I will tell you, people, when they speak about Guru Shakti, they think about a miraculous God. And God doesn't operate through miracles. So, you know, in the times of Guru Raj, you know, everybody was kind of expecting a miracle. So he was there in this room with all these people, and it was in the ambience, you know, that because people, you know, in their minds, you know, they, they look for miracles. They want the, the magical one that changes everything. And that's not the case. That's not what we teach. That's not what Guruji taught. But anyhow, in this situation, he said, I'm going to make a miracle for you. Bring me that uh, yellow flower. So th there was this flower that was yellow. So he took the petals of the flower, crushed them in his hand and say, you are going to pass these petals from one hand to another in circle until they arrive to the last one. And when they arrive to the last one, they will be white. And exactly that's what we did. And when they arrived 
to the last one, they were white. And the yellowness of the petals were in the hands of the 20 something people. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. No more questions? Okay, so if no more questions, um, or no more nothing, we leave it here. And Irma and Maria. Do, does uh, is Luisa starting hers at what time? Seven forty-five. She's going to be logging in. So. so better so that we are not trapped in time. I will send you a link with another yeah. room with the other room, yeah. so that we don't interrupt Luisa. Good. Yeah. So I'll do that. I send you a a link by mail as we close here. I send it to you. Okay. Thanks. So we close. It's a wrap, as we say in the States. It's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, namaste. Bye-bye. See namaste. you next time. Man. Thank you. You have a lot a to go day, with, with all those teachings. Eh? They are good. Nicely selected. <laughs> Homework to do. <laughs>